Good morning and welcome to Birmingham Vineyard's 10 a.m. streaming service. We're so glad you've chosen to be here with us today. Uh, my name is Paul and this is Amy and we're part of the Southwest community here at Birmingham Vineyard. Yeah, and as a church, we exist to help people follow Jesus, live life to the full and make a difference. And as the lockdown restrictions are um, starting to ease a little bit and the summer months are... Um, well, they're in full swing. Um, we're just really looking forward to um, learning about and seeing the ways that you are sharing Jesus with those around you. Today, we're going to start the service with a few songs of worship and then time to take communion together. So if you want to uh, join us with that, uh, go get your bread, your crackers, your juice, your wine, whatever you can find. Um, following that, we're going to hear a message from Andrew and there'll be a chance to respond to that with prayer and then some more worship. After the service, you're welcome to join us on Zoom for an after church video hangout. So it's a chance to mix and mingle with other people from the service on a call. And everyone is so welcome to join us, whether it's your first time here or whether you've been every week. We really hope that you'll join us for that. And the link will be posted in the chat at the end of the service. So keep an eye out for that. Well, we're getting ready to transition into a time of worship um, and I know it might seem kind of strange to, um, to sing or to worship with a computer screen in front of you, um, but the truth is, no matter where you are, um, God is with us. So whether you are um, joining from your lounge or the dining table, um, or whether we were meeting in the building together, um, God is with us um, and he wants us to respond um, to him. And so just let that be an encouragement to you today. Um, so as we prepare to worship, just um, take a few moments just to get into a posture to do that. Um, calm, your, calm your heart and your mind. Um, maybe you wanna stand up, uh, maybe you want to kneel, you can stay sitting, um, just get into a place where you are quiet and ready um, to worship God. And as you do that, I'm gonna read um, just a little bit of Psalm 105 for us. Give thanks to the Lord and call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all of his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Every storm, you'll be faithful. 
above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. And break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your man lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. You have done great things. You have done great things.
We're going to take communion now as part of our worship and response to God. Communion is one way that we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for each of us with his death on the cross and to remind us of the limitless love Jesus has for us. Before we get, do that, I'm going to just read this short reflection and then we'll take communion together. Jesus, thank you for the gift of communion, for the chance to break bread and drink wine in remembrance of your love. God, thank you for giving us your son. In doing so, you made a new promise with the world that all who believe in him will never die. Through him, you bring us hope and a new life here and now. Our shame is released. Our hearts are made new. As we eat and drink these things that represent Christ's body and blood, Holy Spirit, fill us with God's presence. Unite us as one body and one family. Give us the bond of peace and love so that we can be known for our love throughout the coming week. Fill us with your power so that our lives can be a living sacrifice, reflecting your glory here on earth. Together, we choose to say we are one body, one in spirit, united in faith. So let's take communion now as we uh, welcome and reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus and the difference that it makes in our for the sacrifice you made for us and the chance for us to remember that together here. Amen. So even though we're connecting now through technology, it's still great to be able to worship together. If you're joining us for the first time today, a special welcome. We'd love to connect with you and learn about how we can best support and encourage you. Uh, and the best way to do that is to click on the connect button uh, that should be popping up in the chat screen now. Uh, provide us your details and one of the team will be in touch. We just want to take a chance to say a huge thank you to everyone who gives regularly uh, to the life of the church. You're enabling um, the mission of the church to go forward um, and we're able to connect with people in really creative ways during this really hard time. So just a huge thank you. Um, if you'd like to give online, you can click on the give button. And um, if you're joining us for the first time today, um, we just want to say you are under no obligation to give. You are our special guest, and we are just so thankful that you're joining us today. So you may have been excited to hear the news last week from the government that certain uh, restrictions were being lifted on churches being able to meet. And this brought a sense of excitement and anticipation. However, on Monday, the small print was released. The headline sounds great, but the list of restrictions is lengthy. For example, the gathered church um, can't involve any congregational sung worship. The guidelines advise against social interactions between anyone except uh, your own household or your bubble. Children have to remain with their parents at all times. Two metres distance must be maintained if that's not possible. Face masks are revised. Communion and prayer that involve interaction are not permitted, nor is any hospitality or refreshments. So considering all of those restrictions and even, even others, we feel like we just can't responsibly meet um, in the church building yet. Um, and we, we really miss being able to see everyone and to meet together. Um, but so much of what we treasure about church wouldn't be able to happen. Um, our primary concern is the safety and the health of everyone who enters through the church. And there's just still so many risks and so many restrictions, um, and they're just still really limiting. Um, so we have decided that we will not be meeting in person um, in the church buildings for the short and kind of the medium term. 
Um, we've been talking with the leadership of the Vineyard Churches, UK and Ireland, and other church pastors, and have learned that that's what pretty much all the other Vineyard Churches are doing this summer. They won't be meeting in their church buildings. So we do eagerly await being able yeah. to meet together again in person, and we are actively making detailed arrangements to make sure we do that safely, well, and wisely. And we'll communicate more about what to expect with that in the coming weeks. In the meantime, please continue to join us for this for Online Church. And if you have any questions, then please do email the church office at info at birminghamvineyard.com. Well, as we have said, as a church, we exist to help people follow Jesus, live life to the full and to make a difference. And we know that so many of you are making a difference in your communities and neighborhoods and in your families. Um, and we've been hearing about that on Sundays. And so um, Jess Munson is our compassion coordinator for the church. And so she's getting ready to talk with Helen Pipe, who is the food bank coordinator, to let us know what... Um, what's been happening with the food bank during lockdown. So let's hear some updates from them. Hey, how's it going guys? I'm Jess Munson and I am the compassion coordinator for Birmingham Vineyard. That means I get to work with the amazing Helen Pipe, who is our food bank coordinator. Hi, Helen. Hi, Jess. Thanks for joining us today. Helen, you have been making such a difference in our community, in the wider city of Birmingham with your role with Food Bank. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? I coordinate the Food Bank at Birmingham Vineyard, so that involves liaising with our partner agencies across the city to distribute the food and toiletries bags that are donated by the church. That's awesome. So since lockdown, I imagine it would be have been a bit tricky. I mean, we all read the news of Food Bank needs rising in our city and more more and more people in need what's been happening with food banks since since the lockdown started at the end of march beginning of lockdown seems a long time ago now yeah. um, looking back uh, we decided that we would um, give away all of our food bank stock because the church building was closing we had um, limited donations and people to run our food bank so we took all the food and toiletries to the local trust or trust food bank and to a local hostel which meant that in the next few weeks when um, requests started coming in from food and toiletries it, we didn't have any supplies mm. so we put an appeal out to church and it was amazing we had so many um, items donated that was really helpful and then Morrison's also stepped up and donated a load of food which was really helpful and then we also received a grant from the heart of England for three thousand pounds which was a bit of a lifesaver because it, it meant that we could fill a load of bags. So that was really great. Wow, that, that sounds like a lot of bits of generosity, both from the church and from the grant. Anything else that we've been up to? Yeah, we've been um, getting calls from individuals, actually. Some people who are really desperate for help. Um, some people who've been furloughed, just families who've got no access to public funds requesting help. and. What we've been doing for them is issuing vouchers to the Trussell Trust food banks that are located across the city um, so they can go and pick up the things that they need. And then when agencies get in touch with us asking for help, uh, we've been able to supply them with um, bags of food and toiletries um, every Tuesday. So we've been working from church um, for the past few weeks during lockdown um, so that those agencies can come and pick things up. That's great. What's, what's been happening with the agencies? Like what kind of stories are you hearing from them? Who are, who are they, they serving? We've been helping um, a variety of different agencies. So um, some of them help women and men who've been trafficked or are suffering from domestic violence and have had to leave their homes. So they're looking for accommodation, maybe in a hostel. So we've been giving bad bags to um, the Women's Refuge. We've been working with a charity called Adavu and Westminster's Anti-Slavery Network. We've also been giving bags to the hospital for their homeless patients. Mm. And we've been working with an agency called Waits, which helps women who um, need to leave their homes quickly and setting them up with accommodation and help. And it's a lady called Crest who comes to pick up the bags for them. She's been able to tell us some of the stories of the people that she works with. Um, 
they received the bags from us and she says that they're so lonely and depressed and just feeling really isolated at this time. It's quite a challenge for them. Um, she said that the bags have made a real difference to them because it, it reminds them that they're not forgotten and that people are thinking about them, which, which is great. That's what we want for the things that we're giving away. Wow. That is really incredible. I, I know that in, in May, you know, we, we got to work together also on the Care Packs project, which our church donated so generously to. And the agency workers that we were able to give bags to said the same thing. They said, these bags, these nice touches just help the, the women that they serve who have been through really, you know, some of them such horrible situations. It helps them feel seen and loved. And we just want to celebrate. I mean, with this Care Packs project, there was over a thousand pounds of cash donated to um, the project. And we've got to make over 130 bags of little packets of toiletries and some treats for, for vulnerable women in Birmingham. So that was another really fun story from this last kind of term with compassion stuff, wasn't it? Yeah, the church has been so generous. Um at this difficult time just giving where they can to help it's been really helpful yeah. if people do want to donate they can um bring along their donations on a tuesday to church between 9 30 and 12 30 so that's when we're we're at the, at the church building um but they can also donate financially by the church website so if people want to do that they can um, find the link on the website that's great thank you so much helen so as a church community how can we be praying for food bank um, there's three things I think that we can pray for. Firstly, just thanking God for his provision. Um, those really timely donations that came just at the right time for us. Um, and then praying for a blessing for our partner organisations that are working at this really difficult time. Um, and then finally, just praying that the food bank bags get to the people that need them. And they bring that little um, bit of hope to those people who are feeling really lost and lonely at this time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for all that you do. Is it okay that we pray right now? Yeah, that's great. Great. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for um, the way that you have worked through our church community and through the generosity of other people in Birmingham for your provision for the food bank in these last couple of months. Thank you for providing food and, and finances to buy food for for our people in need in such surprising ways. We thank you and give you the glory for that. God, we pray right now for your blessing over all the partner agencies that Food Bank works with. We pray that they would um, be sustained by you. Some of them are working in such strenuous circumstances and not able to serve their clients in ways that they would like to be able to because of lockdown. And we just pray your blessing for the agency workers that are feeling tired and um, that you would just support them and that continue to, to firm up our connections with our partner agencies. And Father, we also just pray that the food bank would be able to reach the people truly in Birmingham that need it, and that every single person that receives a food bank bag would feel seen, and they would feel known, and, and that they would sense your love through that. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to turn it over to Andrew now, who is with us teaching um, the next sermon in the series of Jonah. Hi there. We're going to carry on our series in the book of Jonah. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Jonah. And just as important to notice that when we come to read the Bible, we also want to let the Bible read us. And what I mean by that is that we can actually take these themes that are in the story in the scriptures and they can actually be themes in our story. And God, by his spirit, can get our attention as we read God's word together. Now, this is not so much a book of prophecy. It's a book about a prophet. This is a strange story of opposites. Everyone does the opposite to what you think they should do. The Ninevites repent. Sorry, spoiler alert. The sailors trust and believe and Jonah rebels. Do you know, if you're a follower of Jesus, you know the fact that sometimes we experience suffering for doing God's will. But Jonah shows us that sometimes we experience heartache or suffering when we don't do God's will. We do the exact opposite. It's a strange theme to think about, but actually it's in there in the story. God's discipline is evidence of us being fathered and an expression of his love for us. That's what it says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Now, our man Jonah, he's a nationalistic guy. He loves his country. He's a proud man. But actually, that pride has turned to be prejudice. 
He's got no tolerance for his enemies. And God's putting a spotlight on that subject in this story and in many hearts. God speaks to him, go to the Ninevites. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. They were brutal and they were taking over a lot of the known world. The problem is that Jonah wants a God of his own making. That's what Jonah wants. He wants a God who judges his enemies and blesses him and his friends. Who wouldn't want that? That's what Jonah wants. And that's what this story is getting at. Somebody once said that God made man in his own image and man returned the favour. In other words, we've made God in our image. We can have this view or perception of who God is. and We just project it onto the sky and think that's how God must be in all circumstances. Well, that's not the real God. And it's not the story that we see here. You know, Jonah has this counterfeit version of God that he projects onto the heavens. And when the real God shows up in this story, which he does, Jonah is not happy. He's thrown into fury or despair. Let's pick it up in verse four. We're going to be in chapter one, verses four to 14. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. God has sent Jonah to a great city, but he refused. And so God sent him into a great storm. Now, this storm very clearly was a result of Jonah's rebellion. Now, the Bible doesn't say that every storm or every difficulty is the result of sin, but it does teach us that every sin will bring us into difficulty. Some of the storms we face are because we live in a fallen and broken world and we ourselves are broken. But we see Jonah in the middle of this God-induced storm and he's fast asleep. Look at verse five and six. All the sailors were afraid and each of them cried out to his own God, And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck. Where he lay down, he fell fast asleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice so that we will not perish. Jonah knows something of the truth. He knows something of the call of God, but he's running away. He doesn't want to speak. He doesn't even pray. He is at this moment depressed. He's disengaged. He's just pretending it's not happening. That's what he's doing. For Rosie and I, as a family, we were going across to um, Europe uh, on a cross-channel ferry one time, just a few years ago, and we had a boat experience of our own. We were just in the kind of the bowels of the ship and it was just lurching around. There was a horrendous storm outside. There were this massive pounding of waves on the side of the boat and we were just getting thrown around. But it was the middle of the night and we just tried to Forget it was happening. We were quiet. And the only thing that kind of broke the silence apart from the pound of the waves was the noise of all of our neighbours, one by one, flushing toilets and just being violently sick, both sides. Horrendous. I think the walls were made of possibly cardboard. It wasn't that, that kind of soundproof. It was a horrendous situation. And all of us chose to pretend it wasn't happening. We didn't want to wake up because waking up properly would just really acknowledge this thing is happening right now. So we just stayed in that sort of slumber state and then had the debrief conversation in the morning. Thank we weren't sick. But we can do that. We can, we can have those bury our head in the sand moments. We can pretend to be asleep or be a bit switched off when things aren't going well for us or around us. Do you know, people who are asleep don't speak. <laughs> we need to be awake to the concerns of our friends, our neighbours. Sometimes we're called to speak God's words and not be silent. Jonah was meant to be awake and not be silent in this moment. Why are we sometimes silent in moments that require response? Well, sometimes we are complacent or we're fearful. We just lie low. Where in in your life might that be true for you? Maybe you bury your head in the sand. Maybe we're silent because we don't know what to say. But what this story really clearly shows us is that some people are desperate for deliverance. Desperate. That's what the sailors were. They were desperate for deliverance. They needed something to change. But actually the person that could do something to help was silent and asleep. Maybe you know someone who's in a desperate place and God is saying, wake up, wake up to the situation and, and speak, speak my love and compassion and truth. Maybe there's a friend who's got fear or anxiety or an overwhelming personal challenge. Maybe there's The friend is about to make a life choice that will damage them and hurt them. And God is saying, listen, they could be praying right now, a simple prayer, God help, as they go to bed at night. And maybe your presence is meant to be spiritually awake to what God wants to do, that you can speak life, hope 
and truth. Maybe God is saying to you in your storm, wake up. The next thing we see in this passage is that storms prompt big questions. Verse seven, and the sailors said to each other, come, let's cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who's responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What's your country? From what people are you? And he answered, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Who are you? Or more to the point, whose are you? Who do you belong to? Do you know, big storms prompt big questions. That was certainly the story for the sailors. They were asking big questions. If Jonah's responsible, what's your story, Jonah? It's interesting that when the captain asked him this question, he said, what do you do? You know, where are you from? And the last one was about his, his race. And then Jonah just takes that last question and answers first. He says, I'm a Hebrew. He starts with his race, his cultural background. Then he says, I worship God. Do you know, it's interesting. There's a contradiction in what Jonah's saying here. Have you spotted that in this story? Jonah's theological statements is at odds with his behaviour. He's saying something he's not living. He's saying, I worship the Lord. Do you, Jonah? Because to worship is to obey. You're saying one thing and you're doing another. Hey, that's not just Jonah. Where do our beliefs and our behaviours not match up? Maybe there's a bit of Jonah in all of us. What we see in the next bit is a picture of real contrast between Jonah and the sailors. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, 12 verses 11 to 14. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up, throw me into the sea, he replied, and it'll be calm. I know it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, look at this, instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they couldn't, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, don't let us die for taking this man's life. Don't hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. We see this incredible contrast in this story between the sailor's response and Jonah's response. God sent this prophet to point pagans towards himself. And now it's the pagans pointing the prophet back towards God. What a contrast. So the sailors have got wrong beliefs, but right actions. They throw the cargo overboard initially. They don't throw over people. They just want to lighten the ship. And then they pray to their gods. And then when the, when the truth is out, they, with all their might, try and row back to dry land. Jonah, he's got the right beliefs, but the wrong actions. Jonah sleeps. He doesn't pray. He doesn't declare God's message or word in any way, shape or form. Jonah's meant to be the one in the story with the right beliefs, but he has no action. That sounds familiar to me with the things that Jesus said. Jesus picks up that kind of theme in his story. He talks about the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. He said, it's not just about what we say, it's about what we do. Because he said one time, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And he said, if you do that for the least of these, you do it for me. James chapter two in the New Testament puts it this way, that faith without works is dead. Well, the Passion translates it, puts it really well. It says, faith that doesn't involve action is phony. When I was a kid, there was a friend that we used to go and visit and had this post-it in the kitchen and it was a, like a courtroom scene and it, and it had this little simple message, you might have seen it. If you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That really caught my attention as a young kid. We see in this story, there's an outworking of God's incredible mercy. There's God's mercy for Jonah and God's mercy for the sailors. It shows us the mystery of God's mercy in action. Do you know Jonah has got a heart problem? Not physically, but it's a, it's a real heart problem. Because unless he can see himself living because of God's mercy, he'll never understand how God can be merciful to evil people, his enemies, and still be just and faithful. He just thinks he's on the right side of God and they're on the wrong side of God. He's self-righteous, he doesn't think he needs mercy. 
He thinks he's right and they need judgment. But you know, God's mercy is bigger than we think. It's, it encompasses those we think who shouldn't be on the receiving end of it. It sometimes involves bringing stuff into our lives that stops us in our tracks. That is God's mercy. God's mercy in this moment was a storm for Jonah. And God's mercy in this moment was deliverance for the sailors. He saves them. Sometimes God saves us from ourselves. Jonah was set on running away from God. And it was God's mercy to interrupt and disrupt his story with a storm to get his attention. Do you know, if we're honest, we're a bit like Jonah. We can have the right answer, but we just don't do it. We don't want God to be God. We don't want God to extend mercy to those that have hurt us or wronged us or offended us. We don't want that for those people. Last thing we see here is peace coming in the storm. Verse 15, they took Jonah and they threw him overboard. And the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows to him. You know, it's fascinating. At this point in the story, Jonah takes the role of the scapegoat. The sacrifice that he makes saves them. The sea calmed down. Jonah really is an example of the way of the cross. He's a way of the Christian way. When Jesus in Matthew 12 speaks about the sign of Jonah, he calls himself greater than Jonah. He refers back to this story. What he means is that Jonah was a sacrifice to save the sailors on that ship at one point in history, but that Jesus would die and sacrifice himself to save us, to save any who would trust in him. He's a type of Christ. The story of Jonah is pointing forward to Jesus. What Jonah couldn't do, but his attitude announces, is fully done by Jesus. Jonah is not Jesus, but he's a type of Christ in the Old Testament, representing an aspect of what Jesus would fully do, fully do when he came to be with us. So this points to a peace in the storm that came when Jonah was willing to sacrifice himself. But it points to a bigger peace in a bigger storm that God brings any one of us if we choose to trust him. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus speaking of his own life and describing his own ministry said this, even the son of man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Do you know, Jonah finds the real God a real mystery, a source of great confusion. That's what's going on in Jonah's heart. He's just confused. How on earth can God be so merciful and forgiving? to people who've done such incredibly wrong things. How can God be both merciful and just? That's what he's wrestling with. You know, maybe as we come to look at this part of the Bible today, you might find yourself in a storm. Maybe you're in a storm that is just of your own making. Maybe it's just living in a broken world. Whatever the circumstances or what's behind the storm, you're in a storm right now. Maybe you find yourself very disengaged and switched off. You're just burying your head in the sand. God is maybe trying to say, wake up. I want to let my word be known in your heart. I want to be present and intervene in that storm. Maybe you're running from God right now. You've just actually made some choices that are taking you away from his best for your life. And God is saying, listen, let's get this story back on track. Don't run away. Maybe you find yourself asleep in the boat. God is actually wanting to wake you up to him, to his purpose, so that you can be a presence and a voice for friends or people that are in distress right now. He wants you to stand up and speak up for him, to show compassion and kindness to people that are in distress, in great distress around you. Maybe you're a bit like Jonah, you've got the right ideas, but there's no outworking, there's no action. There's a disconnect between what you believe and what you do. Are we okay with God being God? That's what this story shows us, that actually sometimes God initiates or allows things to happen to, to pull us back on track. That's what was happening for Jonah. He'd gone the other direction and God's purpose was going to get derailed. And God said, no, it's more important that you're back in the heart of what I want you to do and be for the sake of so many things that will take place through you. What does running away look like for you? Maybe that's something you're doing. As we finish, I want to just recognise this reality that's expressed in this story. This is a real challenge for Jonah because Jonah has a problem with God. Jonah's problem with God goes something like this. I don't trust you. I can't trust you right now. Because I cannot see a good reason for the thing that you've commanded me to do, I'm concluding there can't be a good reason. God says, go to your enemies, speak to them. I can't work out a conclusion to that that is good or right. 
So I'm going to let my little view of the world be projected onto you and say, because I can't work out a good conclusion, there isn't one, I'm not trusting you, I'm not following you, I'm disobeying you. Maybe you feel that God has asked you to do something. To follow Jesus is hard and challenging. Some of the moral choices that it impacts, some of the things that he requires of you, and you think, because I can't see God's ultimate good in it, I can't work it out, I can't get my head around it, I'm not going there. I'm not going to say yes. I'm not going to surrender every part of me to him. But what's taking place in that moment is that you're, you're really becoming a travelling companion of Jonah. You're basically saying, I'm with Jonah because I can't work out the end of this and I'm not trusting. I'm just going to play in that, stay in that place of mistrust and not having confidence. This story just exposes our hearts and says, will we trust God even when we don't know the outcome and we can't fully get our heads around the thing that God's asking us to do? Maybe there's something he's invited you to do. Part of your cost of following him. And it just feels great and it feels heavy and it weighs on your heart. Don't take your perspective and project it onto God and say, God, because I can't get my head around it, I'm not going to give you my trust and my obedience. Why don't we take a moment to pray? And I pray that as we've read this story, this story will have read us today. There may be one or two themes or conversations you want to pause and actually have with Jesus. I'm going to pray in a moment. And as I do... There's going to be a moment of response. Just the worship team will play gently. And actually, you might not want to sing the song, but you might want to use that moment just to have a conversation with God and recognise, where do I see myself in this story? And what is God saying, saying to me? How is he inviting my heart to be opened up again to his boundless love and incredible mercy? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word speaks to us. We see in this story of a prophet running away so many things, if we're honest, we can see in our own hearts. And we pray that by your spirit now that you would just let one or two of those storylines that are most relevant settle in our imagination, settle in our thinking, and that we would have a conversation with you right now about what you're saying and what you're wanting to do in our situation. God, I pray that we'd wake up and be alert to your word, that we would hear your word to our hearts and that our story would come alive as we say yes to you. Just wanna pray particularly for those that are finding it hard to trust you because the story and the scene is just one we can't get our heads around. God, help us not be a traveling companion of Jonah who just comes into a place of mistrust and has to work it out before he'll trust you. Help us trust you in the midst of our storm. And we thank you as well that this story speaks of Jonah laying down his life to bring peace for the sailors. And it speaks of a bigger story and a better story of Jesus, you, the son of man, coming to lay down your life as a ransom for many so that we could experience peace with God in the storms of life. Thank you that you're present with us in whatever we face. We open up our hearts and our lives to you again today. We say yes, help us not run from you, but run towards you because you're full of love and full of grace. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, Lord, um, let that be our prayer that we will choose to bless your name in the highs and in the lows. Um, God, may we look to you. May we be aware of the blessings that you have given us. May we bless your name in turn. And whatever the rest of this day or week or month holds, God, may we say yes to you. Amen. Well, we would really encourage you to um, take the opportunity to receive prayer today. If there's anything in your life that you would like prayer for, you can do that by clicking on the live prayer button. Um, I know it might seem a little strange to request prayer um, by clicking a button and being prayed for um, over a chat, but it doesn't take away the fact that God wants to meet with you. Um, it doesn't take away the fact that our prayer team, um, they are there and eager and wanting to pray for you. Um, over the last few weeks, we've been hearing some really encouraging stories about people praying um, through this live chat and um, people have immediately felt healing or immediately experienced God. Um, so we'd really encourage you to do that today. 
And when you click on the live prayer button, you'll be connected with one of our team in a private chat room and your prayer request is confidential. So God's stirring up stuff in us all the time. So whether it's getting prayer here today or during the week in small group, we want to bless what God is doing in each of our lives. If you're not yet connected to a small group or just don't have that type of community around uh, that can support you with prayer in your life, we would love to get you connected. So please do reach out to us. Yeah. Um, and another way to connect is the after church Zoom, um, which is getting ready to happen just in a few minutes when we're done here. So um, take a moment to um, fill up your hot drink, get a slice of cake, maybe get some crisps, um, whatever you've got, um, if you want something to, uh, to snack on, and then join us for the Zoom. It's a great chance to connect with one another um, and catch up. We'll be posting the details for that in the chat um, now, I think. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us today. Our team will be sticking around to pray for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, so do get uh, involved with that if you feel like God's on your case about something. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you next Sunday.